Hey, this is Kyle with Free Tours by Foot. Located right now in Midtown. Uh, you might recognize this big building behind me right here because that's what we're going to be doing a tour of, right? We're going to walk all around Grand Central Terminal. We're going to learn all about the history of like the several different terminals that existed beforehand, see some secrets about what's going on inside there. So we're going to just get started. I'm going to turn right around and we're going to start walking around and I'm going to point out everything that you could possibly ever want to imagine about Grand Central Terminal. So the very first thing that you need to know about Grand Central Terminal is that this is the third of three different terminals that were at this spot. So there was Grand Central Depot, then Grand Central Station, and this is Grand Central Terminal. This all has to do with one man whose name was Cornelius Vanderbilt. You'll see a statue of him coming up in just a little bit. At the time of Cornelius Vanderbilt's death, he was an estimated worth of, in today's dollars, about $200 billion. <laughs> $200 billion, that's like two Jeff Bezos's at this point. He was the second wealthiest person in history at the time of his death. But what's really interesting about him is that his great-great-grandfather was an indentured servant. And he essentially like worked his way all the way up to being one of the most wealthy people in history. You can So now you're kind of getting in. You can see that statue zooming in <laughs> right there. Cornelius Vanderbilt was kind of known to be, uh, he lived actually pretty modestly, but he was not above commissioning a statue of himself outside of what he saw as his grand achievement, the Grand Central Terminal Station right here, right? So Cornelius Vanderbilt, he actually started off as a ferry operator. He started his own ferry company at age 16, made some money ferrying people across uh, throughout the New York Harbor. Then he bought some railroad tracks, then he bought some more railroad tracks, he bought some more railroad tracks, and pretty soon he had so many railroad tracks that he needed a place for them all to meet in one spot. So the very first, like I said, building that he would have built was called Grand Central Depot. Grand Central Depot basically just didn't have enough space for him, so it only lasted for about 30 years from 1871 until 1900 when there was Grand Central Station, the second of which. Now, this is the third version of this. This goes back to 1913. It's in what's called the Beaux Arts style, which is essentially just means really heavily influenced by the French. You kind of see this, so when you think of a place like Versailles or these kind of French nobility, or aristocracy, you might see something similar, right? This collection of statues right here, there's kind of an inside joke if you've seen other videos or if you've been on my tour ever. I always say that New Yorkers are the worst at naming things, and that continues there. This statue pretty much is just called Transportation. Now you could call it, if you really wanted to be fancy, the Glory of Commerce, which is not really much better of a name. It also has another name called Progress with Mental, which sounds almost like an abstract art piece right there. But that's over 48 feet tall, weighs 1,500 tons, and at the time it was completed in 1914, was considered the largest the largest sculptural group in the world. Several different Greek gods, Mercury out front, was the god of transportation. But the clock associated with that massive, huge clock, in fact, the bottom section of that clock can actually open as a trap door, so you can go out and, like, push the, the hand forward. That was because when they built that clock initially, it was always running late, so every single day someone had to go out and like push the hand forward a little bit. We're walking around kind of just the side, giving like more of a view around. You do see over in the background over there, that's the Chrysler Building. The Chrysler Building was the tallest building in the world for one year. Probably heard of the Chrysler Building. It's commissioned by Walter Chrysler of the car company. Walter Chrysler literally is on record saying he just wanted to build a building as a monument to me. So he commissioned a guy named William Van Allen to complete that in 1930. 1930 was finished, and it was the tallest building in the world for one year, and that's because shortly afterwards there was the Empire State Building, which was the tallest building in the world for like essentially the next 40 years. You also will get a sense, oh, back over here is a very new building just opened within the last couple months and the time we we're talking about this in 2001 December of 2000 excuse me <laughs> December of 2021 that is called one Vanderbilt it's uh, you know hear the name Vanderbilt 
It has nothing to do with that particular Vanderbilt, except for it's just took the name. Across the street, what I'm zooming in and right here, there's an eagle. And that eagle, you might be forgiven to just walk right past it, never notice it. A lot of people would never notice that, particularly, that particular eagle. However, that eagle is really notable and interesting because that eagle adorned the Grand Central Station Terminal. It's one of the very few secret things you can find in Grand Central Terminal that goes back older than the terminal itself. So that was one of several eagles that were around Grand Central Station, the second of which, which was completed in 1900. When that was completed in 1900, the problem was that it had all above ground trains and after some notable incidents where people were killed by above ground trains, then they made a quick law that said that all trains in this area that moved at certain speeds needed to be underground. And so that's why they had to build Grand Central Terminal. We're walking in, not the main entrance. Um, I like this entrance a little bit better. It's a little bit quieter, fewer people around. It's actually a little bit more convenient in my opinion as well too. Um, I'll kind of point that out when we're going through. I want you to notice above, that section right above right there, there's the clock and then kind of a viewing gallery. Uh, reason why I'm gonna bring that up is we're gonna be up there near the end of the tour. And so you just kind of get a sense of location. Sometimes it's easy to get lost in Grand Central Terminal because it is very massive and huge and kind of different levels. Some parts it's really huge, some parts it feels really enclosed. So I just wanted to mention that. We're going through in December of 2021, as I was mentioning, so you're going to see a lot of Christmas decorations all around here. We're very close to Rockefeller Center, where there's the tree, to Bryant Park, where there's the Christmas markets as well. And you open up, if you've never been inside of Grand Central Terminal, this is a pretty impressive sprawling view that you get right off the bat. This is the main gallery here. Now, Grand Central Terminal, when it was completed, was the largest train station in the world. This was competing with Penn Station, which was on the other side of the island, which, when, which was the second largest train station in the world. So New York and Manhattan had two of the largest train stations in the world, pretty much walking distance from each other. You know, it would be a bit of a walk, but still. Cornelius Vanderbilt specifically wanted to have this massive palatial feel, and we're gonna look up at the ceiling in just a second but he wanted to have the constellations above. Now, when they originally completed the constellations here, they had it reversed, so it was actually backwards. So it would have been like the view you'd have if you were looking at Earth from above. So it was, everything was flipped. And there's a notable, very famous quip that Cornelius Vanderbilt had, where someone said, a journalist pointed out, he said, you know that that's flipped, right? And he says, yes, I know, because that's the view God has looking down upon us. There's a little bit of a dark spot there. You see that kind of like brick it looks dark right in the center of the panning there. It's a little bit hard to capture. Now that was done intentionally because there was a huge restoration project that happened here. It took place in 1982. The ceiling was completely covered with dirt grime. This was actually from several of the, the trains, but it was mistakenly attributed to uh, cigarette smoke. But out of all people, Jackie Onassis spearheaded saving Grand Central Terminal in the early 80s. This was because just a few decades prior, there was the actual destruction of Penn Station, which was the sister station, as I was talking about before. And that was seen as such a travesty that people said that they didn't want the same fate to befall Grand Central Terminal. So there was a big, huge push in the 70s and in the 80s, spearheaded by Jackie Onassis, and they saved it. They made it a landmark, made it really hard to tear down. And in 1983, they sunk about $12 million in 1983 dollars into restoring this to its original you know, luster, building out what would have been originally part of it and making it uh, what we see today. And ahead of us is one of the most famous clocks in New York City, if not the most famous clock in the entire city. It certainly is the clock that most people would see out of every other clock in the entire city. Now this, according to the Grand Central Terminal website, is valued at $20 million, and that's because it is made from opal glass. And that's not the gem opal itself, it's a style of glass. But this clock is known to be one of the central meeting points in all of 
New York City. In fact, there's a famous phrase, if you just walk down the street and you say to someone, well, someone that you know, if you say to someone in New York City, meet me at the clock, this is the clock that you're allegedly talking about. So everyone is supposed to know that this is the clock. This would be the main entryway that you would go through. You do have these really cool chandeliers up above right there. I like to point those out and, you know, more of that Beaux-Arts style inside here. Now, these chandeliers here are each 800 pounds, each one of these. They can be kind of raised and lowered to do necessary cleaning. Uh, and they have over 100 light bulbs in each and every single one of those. <laughs> you know, they often have to be changed. Uh, I'm going to point this out a little bit later because it's a little hard to see here. But when you're in person, take a look at those chandeliers because you'll notice small acorns adorn the chandeliers. And uh, I'm going to talk about what that means a little bit later on when we can get a better sense of it, a better view of it. This would be the view you'd have walking in through the main entrance. This would be walking under Park Avenue. That straight ahead there is the meeting clock. You'll also tell, you'll always tell people to meet you by the clock. This is the meeting hall. So you see a lot of people kind of milling about, hanging around while they're waiting for their trains or meeting people. We're going to be heading downstairs. Now, I know I'm kind of jumping around all over the place a little bit on this tour, but I do want to get back a little bit to talking about the restoration because that was a big deal. Now, train travel obviously was a massive, huge way of transporting people and goods throughout a lot of American history. The deal was when these were completed in the early 1900s, it seemed like an amazing idea, but very quickly you would have seen, just within the next few decades, air travel take over as the dominant way of moving people from place to place. So both Penn Station and Grand Central Terminal, their ridership dwindled dramatically and because of that people were going in there less also this was paired coming up at the time in new york city where there was less tax revenue less fewer people going into the city fewer people living in the city so both stations would have seen fewer and fewer people they would have had less and less money and they would have started losing money that was the reason why penn station was sold and made way for madison square garden and they wanted to make this space into high-rise condominiums, but then obviously that didn't happen right there. This here, so these are several of the different entryways, and you see this ornate work right there. There you see a lot clearer the, that acorn style that I'm talking about, that symbolism. I just would like to peek in right here real quick, just so you get a sense of what it would look like. It's a lot less interesting once you go inside. <laughs> just pipes all over the place and just kind of dirty, gross trains. So we just bop right out of that real quickly. But that those acorns, you see that above that archway there too. I'll point out some more as we go around as well. All of those acorns represent the Vanderbilt family. Vanderbilt family now is a pretty established family, but like I said before, Cornelius Vanderbilt really kind of built that family name. Now the Vanderbilt family has their symbol, their official family symbol as the acorn. And that acorn, you see more of them all over the place right there. The acorn represents the basic idea of from small acorns grow great oaks. That's, you know, if you watch like Game of Thrones, there are these different like sigils and there are different like sayings like a Lannister always pays his debts. That would be what you could say the saying of the Vanderbilt family would be, was from small acorns grow great oak trees, right? So that's why you're going to see those all around the place, just like everywhere all throughout the terminal here. You're going to see more of them right here, more acorns, but this is a vastly different spot. It's like still on the same level, but this is just around the corner from where we were before in what's called the Whispering Gallery of Grand Central Terminal. Those ceilings right there are Gustavino tiled ceilings. It's just a way of keeping up the structure. A specific person, Gustavino, found a way to do that really well, so they're that tiled. Now you see people standing in the corner, kind of like talking into the corner. You can do this when you come to Grand Central Terminal. You stand opposite each other. If you talk into the corner, it will actually echo, echo and ricochet all around to the other side. And you can talk to someone. It sounds like you're talking to someone right next to you. It's pretty incredible, right? You do see right ahead the Oyster Bar. There's been a restaurant there since the early days of Grand Central Terminal. Just wanted to give you a, a view inside of there. 
so you can kind of see inside beautiful huge indoor space and I'm kind of creepy <laughs> looking at people while they're eating right there just wanted to give a sense and show you what it was like inside of that space there but we're gonna kind of just flip around but you get another view of the whispering gallery just above those are the same chandeliers we were seeing earlier so I know again it gets a little bit twisty and turny where are we right now what's happening that's the main entrance that's underneath park right there and so you would walk above this whispering gallery and we just kind of did a little bit of a loop to go down below so again you'll see more people just kind of standing in corners talking this happens all the time when you're in Grand Central Terminal if you don't see anyone there it's actually kind of weird um, but everyone's looking trying to figure out the best way to do it but it's you stand opposite so diagonal from each other and you talk into the wall and it should sound like there's someone standing right next to you right we're doing kind of this last little loop around here uh, I want to show you this these beautiful elevators here not for any particular reason about the elevators themselves but because they have listings for floors right okay Campbell bar so we're gonna talk about that that's gonna be the last thing but we see number four tennis club and that is sometimes surprising to people to learn that there is actually a tennis club in Grand Central Terminal you can play tennis if you join that club in Grand Central Terminal and so it's kind of a cool space they have like part of the arches are visible from the courts why I'm walking back around this way is there's a small branch for the New York Transit Museum uh, the official one would be in Brooklyn kind of near downtown Brooklyn over by Borough Hall really worth going to now the Transit Museum focuses on the different transportation systems throughout New York City but the big heavy focus there is on the subways so that's why you see a little outpost right over there not at that branch but the, the main branch that's in Brooklyn it's worth going to because it's an old train station that's been converted into a museum so in the basement level they have different train cars throughout history and it's really cool you see like some of the early ones with their like weird wicker furniture and even you know sometimes you see like a reading light <laughs> for the subway <laughs> they're like the 1970s ones where they have these kind of stainless steel contraptions look kind of futuristic and so it's just the film movies there it's just a quick little plug if you're looking for more things to do in New York City like you can't find enough for some reason and things to do it's worth going to that we're getting one kind of last look at the main hall right here when we're gonna go up the stairs so where we're going up the stairs is West Balcony we're gonna be exiting because one of the last things I want to show you will be uh, another secret place that you can find in Grand Central Terminal it's debatable I guess how secret it is since there's like listings and names and it's a business <laughs> but still so just right before the pandemic there was an estimated 67 million people served a year through Grand Central Terminal I don't think we have quite the numbers back from right now but there are several different train lines there's an estimated one train a minute that arrives during rush hour but what I'm really pointing out here you see it's a person hanging out there it would be very easy to just completely miss this person altogether but you might not know that that's what you're seeing in that kind of grand window those are all just skyway walking paths to different offices above you know if I had the access I would love to take you up there but I don't so we're not gonna be able to see it the secret thing we're gonna be going to is one of the last things where it says the Campbell apartment here and we're gonna be exiting through the door so this would be the exit through the western side so that's one Vanderbilt which I pointed out earlier in the tour just across the street right over there and where we're going around is into this entrance back over here people sometimes do uh, they, they call this the secret bar everybody keeps calling it a secret bar but there's literally like signs all over the place they don't make it a secret how to get in it's just lesser known and it's one of the things that if you didn't really know what you were looking for it might not really register because it's called the Campbell apartment but the Campbell apartment is actually just a bar and so you'd go in this way you'd uh, you know a nice cool little entryway going above on the other stories won't really do you anything see more acorns up above right there and that's the entryway for you to go to the Campbell bar all it is is uh, a former office of a man named John Campbell 
who is a member of the Central Railroad's, New York Central Railroad's board of directors. So this was used as an office space. It was used as a studio by CBS. It was for a while used as a jail by the Metro North Railroad. Um, what it has been for several decades now is just a fancy upscale bar. I do have one more thing that I wanted to point out. Uh, it's a little bit of a hike away, so I'll just kind of cut away at some point. But um, when you exit this way, then there's another building that's on the other side that isn't technically Grand Central Terminal, but is associated with Grand Central Terminal. When I was talking about the history of the railroad and Grand Central Terminal, I hinted that there was air travel took over. There's a building that's directly behind Grand Central Terminal, not this one that you're looking at right here. I'm just trying to like get a good view of it. But that building that's directly behind, so there's Grand Central Terminal, you get a like cool view of the side. And then up from there, then you're going to see what's called the MetLife building now. This was originally the Pan Am building. When this was completed, it was one of the tallest buildings in the world, never the tallest building in the world. But this was completed in the 1960s, and it was completed as the Pan Am building, because that was the building that was housing all of Pan Am Airways. And do you think it was a very important symbol that they basically built their building on top of Grand Central Terminal. That was a very intentional symbol by Pan Am to say that we're the new big dogs in town, no longer is it railroads, now it's all about air travel. And what they really did as well is they cut off two buildings from each other, because the last thing we're going to talk about is another building that's pretty important that was associated with Grand Central Terminal, is technically a, a different building, but I like to see it as like a two-for-one deal. So you're going to get to talk about Grand Central Terminal and a second building. I want to just give you a sense. So this building off in the built distance over there is currently called the Helmsley Building. So we're going to flip around and I'm going to kind of cut to show you the front of the Helmsley Building and talk about why it's associated with Grand Central Terminal. So here's the approach where you see a bunch of cars that will be going in. Now when I you saw before there's that big huge you know, viaduct for all the cars to go around Grand Central Terminal. And you're wondering where do they spit out? Well, here you go, right there. They go in one side, they come out the others. You can actually walk underneath the Helmsley building as well. Now I'm going to walk around to get a better view of this building. You know, you get a big, huge sense of kind of the structure we're talking about. But the Helmsley building was built not being called the Helmsley building. It was known as the, the Central New York Transportation Building. And when it was built, it was entirely there to house the offices for the railroad. This was going to be built 10 years after Grand Central Terminal. And because it's built 10 years after Grand Central Terminal, it's in a very similar style. So you see this ornate, huge Beaux-Arts style again, currently called the Helmsley Building. Another big, huge clock on that side as well. Originally, this would have housed the offices for the railroad. This was also, at the time of its completion, the tallest building you would have found in what was called Terminal City. And then that wouldn't be until the Pan Am building took over, again showing there's a new game in town right here. There was infamously a mafia murder that happened inside this building, where a man named Lucky Luciano basically created later on the five families of the mob of New York City. But that's a whole other story, a whole other tour. Maybe we'll do that another time. Just like to point out this as a nice bookend to talk about the Helmsley building here on the other side of Grand Central Terminal. I hope you've enjoyed the virtual tour of Grand Central Terminal here. There are several tours that you can take that we give through free tours by foot on our website, freetoursbyfoot.com, that you can go throughout Grand Central Terminal. There's one that is entirely just of Grand Central Terminal. It's great for a rainy day, a cold day, or just even a sunny day that you want to see this beautiful terminal. There are other Midtown tours, which will be covering this. Pretty much every tour of Midtown will cover this, and you'll be inside, and you'll see all of the things and more that we've talked about in the video.